Good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at uh, Emory Executive Education at Goise Weather Business School. Um, we continue to be um, thrilled and excited by the interest that we're having in the Business Over Breakfast uh, webinar series, and in particular, um, the number of people that are following the Economy and Me series uh, that we have been bringing every Thursday morning during April and we'll continue. Uh, this is the fourth and we've got one more to, to go. Um, we are going to ex uh, keep this uh, series going with some other topics in May and June and probably uh, continue uh, if uh, everybody out there is, is still interested. Our faculty guide for the Economy and Me webinar series is Tom Smith. Um, and many of you have been following us um, each morning, each Thursday morning, and know that Tom is an expert in many, many things and becoming um, an, an expert in um, uh, the economy in during a crisis and pandemic as well. Um, but amongst those, uh, those things that he has um, uh, spent time researching and teaching, a labor economics, uh, pricing, sports economics and financing, um, as well as the economics of the entertainment industry and healthcare. So we are in very good hands, um, as many of you know, with uh, with Tom Smith guiding us uh, during these uh, during these sessions. Um, we are still uh, working on answering the questions that aren't answered during the webinars. Um, please be patient; we will get to them. Um, but also be aware that Tom is um, uh, on different, um, uh, being reported by different uh, journalists, also on different webinars um, that are showing up. So uh, watch out for those as well if you want to uh, continue to, to hear past the Thursday mornings. And for those um, of you who want to deepen and broaden your skills um, in the area of personal financial um, personal finance, uh, we are running a series of workshops. The next one is on May 1st. And Tom, I'm working on, on uh, getting my husband to sign up on that one. Ah. <laughs> okay. Wish me luck. Um, so Tom's going to kick off the webinar um, with his observations about what's been happening in the economy, what's been happening behind the headlines. And then we will uh, continue with the Q&A, which I know is uh, very robust. Um, please write your questions in that Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. I can see this. I think there's already one there. Um, and um, we look forward to uh, providing you with an, another interesting um, and informative session today. Thanks, Tom. Sure. No, you're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. All right. Um, personal finance Zoom or personal finance session. I think people are already asking about how they can sign up for that. And so if you guys can send out a link to the people who've already signed up, that would be terrific. Or if we've got a link or something that we can show at the, towards the end of the session today, that would be perfect. If we have something like that, Dean. We'll certainly do that. Thank you. Excellent. All right. All right, so um, there's lots of stuff going on here. Um, let me show you this and let's talk about this. So th these, the initial unemployment claims come out every Thursday for the previous Friday. They come about at 8.30. So I, I already downloaded the initial unemployment claims and uh, created some graphs using R, um, one of my favorite programs these days. So uh, last week, uh, excuse me, two Fridays ago, uh, there were 5.2 million people uh, filing initial unemployment claims. Um, so last Thursday, we had 5.5 million additional people, or 5.25 million additional people, which brought the total up to about 22, 23 million. That was just reported about 30 minutes ago that another 4.427 million people filed initial unemployment claims. So you could be wondering, where are all these people coming from? Um, are, are, are they really that many more people who are unemployed? Yeah, there are clearly businesses that are still not able to keep things going. Maybe they thought that they could. Of course, also the system that was that is put in place to report these claims uh, is just not still not set up for the total number of claims that are coming in. Just for reference, I was just researching this yesterday to talk to some students. For, so in 2001, there was, an, there was a recession. The 9-11, .com, WorldCom, Enron, 
recession, okay? During 2001, there were a total of 2.1 million people who were unemployed during that recession, and unemployment for the whole country went up to about 6%. So this is more than 10 times that in the last five weeks. Clearly unprecedented. Everybody that I'm talking to says, you know, put this in context. There's almost no context when you have um, an economic recession that is this insane all at once, right? This overnight recession phenomenon. I mean, usually we have something that trickles in, but this overnight recession is definitely catching us off guard. And so I uh, created these little graphs for you, again, using R. Here's the initial unemployment claims using color coding here. And you can see huge numbers in Florida, California, Texas, right? Pennsylvania, up in New York, okay? But the Midwest isn't being um, treated very well either. So Michigan, Wisconsin, right? The reason that this makes a difference is that, you know, this state, this Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, okay? In case you have done any electoral math in the last couple of years, you know that essentially these three states uh, were the difference between one presidential candidate versus another presidential candidate, okay? I mean, clearly, if you if you flip Ohio, you flip Florida, you're going to have the same thing. The fact that these states are, are having such high unemployment, initial unemployment claims, it does not bode well for any incumbent president or incumbent presidential party. So this is, um, this is bad news for our economy, and it's also bad news for any incumbent, any incumbent in these states or on a national level, uh, incumbents do not do well when you have high unemployment. And so that's giving you a map. And not surprisingly, I, mean, I also mapped this out as an orange, it's not as nice of a color, but not surprisingly, the number of COVID cases, COVID-19 cases, total number of COVID-19 cases uh, looks very, very similar to this map. The only difference is that um, New York is still, let's say, the leader in this particular race. Um, I don't think they want to be the leader, but they are. And so New York has, you know, over 250,000 cases. Uh, we're here. We've got somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 100 to 150,000 cases here. Okay. So, but we're not the lightest shade on this map. All right. It's where, you know, we're up here, right? There's like Wyoming and North Dakota and things like this. They are, you know, explaining, having sh fewer cases. So we're, we're, we're not at the bottom of this particular map. Why would I want to make this point? Well, so our governor has decided that maybe it's a good time for us to um, open up some uh, different types of businesses. So he had an announcement the other day that said, uh, by Friday, going to open up barbershops and salons, um, you know, hair, hair styling places, um, tattoo parlors, and then he's going to open up uh, by Saturday movie theaters, bowling alleys, um, spas, things of this nature. And so it's a very, very strange uh, maneuver considering that it's not even, doesn't seem to be following any guidelines that are put either from the state or the federal. And so then there's a very strange set of let's say back and forth. So I was listening to President Trump yesterday and he said, I disagree with what Kemp is doing. There are fine, fine people. Evidently he likes the people in Georgia. So there are fine, fine people in Georgia, he said, and yet it's probably too early. He'd like to, us to wait a little bit, like Kemp to wait just a tad. Here's how it reflects on us economically, is that you, you may be aware that Unemployment insurance uh, only covers you if you are without a job and actively seeking employment. If you have employment available, uh, the idea is that you're supposed to take that employment. And so the uninsurance program itself is designed as a safety net. And then in order to retain your uninsurance employment, you have to be actively seeking employment. And so what we have here is a scenario where, where if, 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 
if a employer is closed due to COVID, then you can't work. Work isn't available to you. And so you would put on, be put on the unemployment rolls. Okay. If a company or a firm opens back up, um, then you have employment available to you. So if you choose not to go back to work, then you're essentially saying, yes, I understand that there's a job for me, but I don't want that job. Now, clearly, the situation presenting itself now is much more subtle than that, right? People say, I don't want to be uh, exposed, or I don't want to get ill, or I don't want to be dead. I want to stay alive. And so I'm choosing not to go back to work. But unless you're falling into a very few number of categories, like taking care of a sick relative or taking care of somebody who has COVID, uh, you aren't um, immune to the fact that unemployment insurance won't cover you if you have a job that you could go to. So there is some concern that by opening up some shops, some people now will be released from the unemployment insurance because they have an option, okay? All right, and so this is uh, something that we should be paying attention to. What it means potentially is that uh, the number of people, the number of people who are unemployed, officially unemployed in Georgia could very well go down, okay? But um, that doesn't mean that the number of people without a job is going to go down. So there's, there's always a definitional issues. And it could be that uh, businesses will start taking on the wrath of other people that say, how dare you open? I can't believe that you're doing this. I can't believe you're putting people at risk. And so there may be, let's say, a wave that comes as a result of this where people are, let's say, posting about businesses on social media or leaving reviews on uh, whatever, you know, websites saying, you know, I, I hate this company because they're, they've decided to open. Uh, I don't begrudge any company that wants to open if they want to stay alive. I mean, this is, you know, the goal of every company and every company owner that I know is I want to stay alive during this crisis. What do I do? If the governor says that we can open, should I try to open? It's just, uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult to, let's say, social distance while you're giving somebody a haircut or a head shave. I haven't had a haircut in years, but it, that. You know, I mean, I wouldn't go to a barber shop because the person's not going to be six feet from me. They're going to be right on top of me. Of course, that was a little bit of a political nuance, but the truth is that 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 has some economic consequences for us. Okay, uh, let's talk about some other economic phenomenon. So last week they started dishing out the um, the checks, so the twelve hundred dollar or twenty four hundred dollar checks uh, probably would have been input in your account. As of last Monday, I know my older daughter and her family got their checks last Monday. Um, and then I've heard other people saying subsequently they've received money in their bank accounts. That's terrific. All right. The, the PPP pl um, plan, this is the payroll protection plan. Um, people were, were told that they have, let's say, a loan number and were put in a queue, but that money ran out. So last week, someone said, look, there's a rumor that the money was run out. After this workshop, by 11 a.m., the statement was official. There's no more money. So, uh, so that money ran out. So if you're in a queue, maybe there's money for you. If you already have a loan number, maybe they've already just, uh, you know, put some money aside for you. But uh, luckily, the Senate voted on an additional package uh, yesterday. And I think that the Congress is supposed to vote on this. It's about a $428 billion fiscal package that includes another $300 billion plus or minus for the payroll protection plan. So there is a, probably a second round of these. It's not clear if people who are in the queue at the tail end have a spot but just don't have funding and now this will provide funding for them or if people are going to have to apply again or go follow through with their applications because uh, there, there are a bunch of people who haven't got loans. And so clearly lots of uh, anxiety about which companies did receive payroll protection plan money, which companies didn't. There are already some lawsuits out there against um, some larger banks, uh, Chase, uh, Bank of America, 
Wells Fargo, um, because it appears that they were putting larger companies at the front of the line and they were receiving a, um, as, pro as part of the processing of these, of these loans, they receive a fee based on the size of the loan. So clearly in their best interest, well, Wells Fargo, in their best interest, allegedly to push people in one direction or another direction. And so there's already some lawsuits against Wells Fargo for engaging in bad behavior. Okay, not surprising when we have a crisis like this that you have bad actors. All right, so there's another 300 billion in funds that is gonna go out and we'll see how quickly those get put into people's um, accounts. The, there's an emergency portion of the, of the small business loans. And last week I mentioned that people had received emails. I'd received an email, my, my wife's company had received an email that they changed the nature of those instead of a 10 million, uh, excuse me, $10,000 grant, they were gonna give $1,000 per employee. And so those were funded this week. So people who got in right at the beginning have probably seen $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, all the way up to $10,000 put into their primary bank account. And those were grants. Um, this is clearly not enough to keep a business alive, but enough to kind of maybe help you along. The major, uh, let's say, I would say absence within any of these uh, fiscal stimulus packages and right now is any money that's going directly to states. I know other people have talked about it. It is a significant, uh, significant it's, it's such a significant absence that I, that I need to mention it. So the federal government has a power that state governments do not have. And that is the federal government can issue treasury securities. And right now treasuries are trading almost at a zero yield. So they can get money for free. And you say, are people really willing to borrow? Yeah, I mean, people are still buying treasuries. I mean, it's still 100% riskless asset. And so it creates that bottom rung of a ladder of interest rates. So the risk-free asset, the 10-year treasury note, is the essential instrument that, that private and uh, commercial lenders, people who, um, people who are developing sort of a scale, this is what they use. They use the 10-year treasury as that benchmark. And they trade in the 10-year treasury. So the, the federal government can borrow money practically for free. States cannot. And so the ability for the government to do, the federal government to do this makes it, makes it really it, it advantageous for them to borrow money and then give it to the states. Let's say, okay, let's, let's borrow a bunch of money and then as part of this package, give states that have these high needs a, a bunch of funds because states can't go bankrupt, right? Well, it appears that uh, at least if you look at what's in the Senate, the, 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 the 3.5 uh, fiscal package is what they're calling it. It includes, again, no money for states. And if you listen to Pritzker, if you're listening to Cuomo every day, they're saying, um, you know, they, they uh, are not interested in this. And, and when somebody was just mentioned that um, he says he, McConnell, the majority of the Senate says he favors the bank, bankruptcy in the states. I read that last night, which is insane. Like it's, it's the United States, you do not want every state to go bankrupt. It's not in anybody's best interest. It doesn't do the economy any good for a bunch of states to go bankrupt and not be able to fulfill their obligations. I mean, it, you have a power of the, of the federal government to, to make these funds available. They should use it. I know a lot of people are concerned that our debt to GDP ratio is going to be over 100%. And does that take away our ability in the future to grow as an economy? Um, well, we're not Greece. And I mean, make this mention a number of times. N not that I have anything against Greece, but Greece had sort of a history and has a history of, of borrowing over 100% of their GDP and then 
failing to make those debt payments and then having to go to Germany or some other uh, European countries for debt relief, like additional loans. We're not Greece, okay? We have shown we have the ability to in, engage in fiscal restraint from time to time, right? And so, um, yeah, we can get away from politics, right? Uh, if we want to, but it's part of the nature is that all of this, all of the economy, all of the economics right now are related to the, the political undercurrent of should we help? Can we help? Shouldn't we help? Shouldn't we not help? And so it is unfortunate that just about every package has to go through this political body in, in order to be passed. That is just the truth of it. So, I mean, I'm seeing some of these random chats come up here and I'm not interested in talking about politics except for it would be, um, it would be ignoring one of the, one of the sort of the major elements of our economic situation right now to say, oh, this fiscal stimulus package uh, is missing the fact that there isn't anything in the States. So anyway, that's like 22 minutes of what's going on. Um, I spoke a little bit longer about that based on a comment from one of the participants last week. I thought it was a good idea for me to sort of lay the groundwork here. Um, I'm very happy to take questions about what's going on with the economy if people have any. We do, Tom. Um, one of the first questions that came in this morning um, is, what are your thoughts on Georgia's economic forecast given the, co the governor's intent to reopen? I, th I think it's, um, I think it's uh, well-intentioned, but way too soon. That is, I am sure that the governor is thinking that people want to open up their businesses, that people can't stay um, sort of locked up and without revenue forever. I mean, it's impossible, right? And so if we go forward um, as planned and keep everything closed until May 1st and then maybe May 15th and then maybe June 1st, depending on how we're bending the curve, then a lot of businesses are going under the end when they'll never come back. Um, I think that the governor is thinking, okay, then maybe we have to like open things up and see if we can get some money circulating through. I think what's going to happen is that you're, you're, going to open up these businesses. And then in three weeks, we're going to read a news story about a, a barber, an owner of a barber shop who uh, opened up because he had to and because he, you know, he, he thought it was important to earn money and what have you. And then, and then now he's got COVID and he's died. I mean, we're going to read that article. Okay. And that's, uh, that's a tragedy. And then that doesn't help our economy going forward because now everybody's gonna say, okay, we're having a spike in number of cases, we're gonna to have to lock down again. And then when we do open up, are people gonna be even more, let's say resistant to going out and spending money? And what you wanna do is you wanna create an incentive for people to go out and spend money. Well, opening up too soon and then freaking everybody out because we have a spike and then everybody saying, forget about it. Like I'm gonna hunker down even more means that we're gonna have this wave of cases and then it's gonna come down and the second wave of cases is gonna come down. Uh, people aren't gonna know when to open up and a lot of that has to do with testing. So um, we don't have adequate testing. I think Georgia is at the near or at the bottom of the states in terms of the number of testing that we are, are engaging in. And so I, I've read this a couple of times is that Georgia is towards the bottom of the list of where states are testing. And so it's just, it just, everything seems, it seems very, very counterintuitive to me. So I don't think it has long run positive prospects for our economy. As a matter of fact, I think it has the opposite effect. Um, the industries that the governor selected to open this week seem to be the highest touch industries. What do you think the rationale for that is? I think, think the ra I, you noticed that too, or somebody, somebody noticed that too. I think the rationale <clears throat> has to do with service. I think the governor saw, um, I think the governor saw that a lot of people were on the steps in Michigan and were protesting and saying things like, well, we want haircuts. I need my haircut. I haven't had a haircut in four weeks. I need my nails done. So the governor may very well have been watching 
uh, the coverage of these protests in Michigan and said, oh, you, you want haircuts? I'll give you haircuts, right? And you say like, that's ridiculous. I mean, well, he's really opening up barber, salon, uh, barber shops and hair salons because you know, somebody on Fox said they wanted a haircut. Uh, maybe, right? I mean, he hasn't given any additional rationale, but it does seem a little bit strange that, that the organizations, the firms that he's allowing to open up are going to have some of the hardest time social distancing. I wish that was not the case, right? I think, so anybody who's been out and you've gone to, let's say a Home Depot, okay? I went to Home Depot like two weeks ago and there was a, a queue and there was a, somebody who was um, keeping a tab on the number of people who were in the store. They had a, 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 a rope line set up and they had spaces that you're supposed to stand. They were like eight, 10 feet apart. And they were only letting certain number of people in the store and people in the store were wearing masks and gloves and were staying really far away from each other. And I was thinking, okay, like this is, seems to be working, right? I can get in, get what I needed, you know, fix my grill so I could do some grilling and boom, like I got in, I didn't have to interact with anybody, went to the self-checkout, had my gloves on, my mask, it was all fine. Uh, you probably could open up other stores like that, you know, a Steinmart or, a, you know, the other kind of box stores and um, engage in that same kind of social distancing, only a couple people in the store, keep them far apart from each other, make sure that everybody comes in. You say, do you have gloves? Do you have a mask? We're not going to let you in unless you have these things. And probably you could open up some businesses. I don't know what the marginal cost, marginal benefit analysis of that is. What is, is it? Would it be too expensive to open up the store relative to the amount of business that you would generate as a result of that? So it is possible that some of these salons, it, the, the economics works out pretty well. So you say like a so two person salon, if I have you know five or six people who come in for the day, it sort of pay, it, it pays for itself, the, that day pays for itself. That's probably not the case for a you know, a big a box, box store like a Macy's or a Steinmark. You probably need more than six people in there to buy goods and services in order for it to make sense to open up the entire store. And so I'm guessing that there's, there's probably some good economics behind why it is that he's choosing, he's choosing those stores. Uh, let's, let's say this. I am hoping that there's some good economics behind why he's choosing the firms that he is, but it could just be he saw someone on Fox or some other TV station. Thank you, Tom. This uh, next question has received uh, some of the most reactions in the Q&A box. So for clarification, what happens if a business is allowed to open, but they do not open in regards to unemployment? Yeah, so the business, if the business itself, the firm says, I'm, yes, I'm allowed to open, but I'm staying closed then the employees of that firm are still officially unemployed or furloughed, okay? So the, the firm doesn't have to open up just because, just because the governor says that they can open up. And I've seen lots of, lots of companies posting on Facebook and Twitter and what have you saying, we're allowed to open, but we're not going to for the safety of our customers, for the safety of our employees, what have you. So if they don't open up, then it's employee ease would still be considered unemployed. If they do open up and an employee decides not, not to go back to work, then that employee is sort of violating, if you will, the definition of an unemployment. So you're only unemployed if you, if you don't have a job, but you're actively seeking one. Once a job becomes available to you and you turn it down, then, then unemployment insurance says, no, you don't get covered. Like you don't get covered if, you're, if you have available employment. So if a company decides it's not going to reopen, then its employees will remain unemployed. Thanks, Tom. Is there a back to work plan that you support? Is there a back to work plan? That's a good question. Um, a back to work plan, a plan, uh, well, so I haven't seen anybody lay out a plan on a national level that incorporates, um, let's say, all of the safety measures that we, that we know, we, we know what needs to take place. And I just haven't heard anybody, um, let's say, 
fully explain these steps. Now, Trump did, um, he did actually lay out, you know, like the different phases of what's going on, including, let's say, a 14-day period under which uh, you have, you know, a decline in the number of cases. Um, I think that that's, that that in itself is probably a good plan. Along with that, you need to actually be actively testing people to make sure that you're keeping track of the number of cases that you have. If you're not testing people, it can look like you're, the number of cases have gone down when in fact they've actually gone up, right? And so what you really wanna do is you really wanna test people on a consistent basis to know whether or not they're actually, they actually have this disease. And so the back to work plan that I would support would be, yeah, phasing, phasing the economy back in as the number of cases decreases. But in order to do that, you would actually have to be robustly testing the number of people in the economy. And not just people who are saying they're feeling sick, but you'd have to have a random test of just other people because so many people are asymptomatic. So uh, I think the plan has to include testing and it has to include random testing. Then you really know how far this disease has spread. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a national policy to do that and you also have the capability to identify and isolate cases as they come up, identify, isolate, quarantine, then the majority of people could go back to work. I mean, this is the original, there was a New York Times article that was written about this that said, look, like this part of the population is really susceptible and could die from this. And this part of the population seems to be susceptible, but it's not likely to die from this. If we, if we are testing robustly, is it possible that we could actually send this part of the population back to work and quarantine this part of the population and the economy could continue to move, although maybe not thrive, and we could continue to get people safe. I haven't seen that national plan laid out and we don't have the testing capability. So I guess it's to be written, but I'm, I'm curious if somebody can come up with something, can write it. Are there other questions? Yes, Tom, if COVID-19 hadn't happened, do you think the large corporate debt would have triggered a financial meltdown anyway? Uh, not a financial meltdown. So I had written a, I'd written a paper um, and uh, put it out there at the beginning of January. I was talking to my MBA students or my undergrad students about this. And I was predicting, and, and, I, and I talked with a couple different, different um, groups. Um, uh, and I went and talked with uh, a PRG group a couple, uh, right at the beginning of January. And um, I said, you know, I think there's going to be an economic recession in the next uh 12 months. Okay. So that's what I was saying in January. I was thinking that there was going to be an economic recession in the next 12 months because I did, there was a, there were a couple trends that I thought were, um, that were very scary. So one of them was a buildup of farm debt and the number of farm delinquencies. So farm delinquencies had started to go up. Okay. Uh, which was, which wasn't good. I thought if farm delinquencies are going up and our agricultural exports were going down and the prices of our agricultural exports were going down, farmers were in bigger trouble. I thought there was going to be a huge shock to the heartland of the United States. So Indiana, um, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Ohio, Missouri, I thought, boom, bunch of farmers are going to declare bankruptcy. They're going to go out of business. All of the companies that rely on them are going to have trouble and you're going to have this shock in the middle of the country that's going to spread out. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, there's also was a huge amount of corporate debt. So corporations have been, uh, have been levered up and this has not been helpful right now during our current economic crisis because everybody's trying to get capital, you know, capital for liquidity. And so, um, I saw some signs, the oil prices, even in January, after, after General Soleimani was killed, there was this huge downward uh, trend in oil. And I thought, oh, this can't, this can't work that way. If oil keeps trending down, then the oil companies in, in Texas were likely to go um, out of business because oil can only fall so far. And once it falls to, let's say below maybe, $38, $40, somewhere in that, all of a sudden these businesses become unprofitable. 
And then if it falls much below that, the businesses can't really operate. So it's very expensive to start and stop these businesses. So they don't typically start and stop if, if the oil was right at $40. They would chug along even with some losses. But at $0, I mean, you know, with a, a, a negative, um, so, so the forward, the future contracts uh, the other day ended up in the negative. So you could, you could take delivery. You had to take delivery once the contract expired. So you would have had to take delivery, let's say, of a thousand barrels of oil, and somebody would have paid you thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars to take that delivery on oil. Of course, you would have had to literally take delivery of oil, and we've run out of um, storage for oil. So I saw that trend starting back in January, and I thought it was very, very dangerous. So farm debt, farm delinquencies, downward pressure in oil prices, I thought if you get a shock to the heartland and then a shock to our energy portion of our country, we could fall into a recession. But I was predicting a recession more in the magnitude of the 2001 recession, not something in the magnitude of the Great Depression, clearly. Um, how's online retail doing? Are people still buying large ticket items when their jobs are at risk? Well, my understanding is that online retail is very, very robust. Um, and so I did see a report on this on, it was Market Watch. Uh, I think I read it two days ago that some online retailers are reporting just they can't, they cannot even keep up. Um, that's putting pressure on other parts of our system. Okay. And so I know like UPS drivers and some other drivers are saying, you know, this is really dangerous for us. I mean, we are the total number of packages that we're delivering is insane. And we feel like really, really, really exposed. And so it does have some ramifications, but that said, it looks like online, online orders are, are really robust, but it's not clear exactly what it is that people are ordering. So if they're saying like, hey, I'm going to order a new sweater, or order some new flip flops is one thing. Right. Um, but, it, I don't know if they're ordering things like, let's say, washing machines, right? People certainly aren't having cars delivered, you know? I and mean, that, that was the thing of the past, I think, right? So um, I think online, online orders and online um, is really robust. Like I said, I read this in Market Watch two days ago that some companies are saying they can't even keep up with the number of orders, but it's not clear what they're ordering. And so there might be a lot of stuff, lots of volume. Um, it might not be big ticket items. It might not matter. I mean, if you increase the volume by two or three fold, it really might not matter what people are buying as long as you've got some kind of a cash flow. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's fine, but it doesn't help our local economies. Uh, not really, right? I mean, what we need for local economies is people to go out and buy at local stores. And you might say, but that sounds like you're, like you're contradicting yourself earlier when you were suggesting that maybe Kemp shouldn't be opening up some of these establishments. Um, I want businesses to be able to sell their wares to consumers. I want it to be safe, right? I, I think that people should stay alive. It's an important part of our economy is, is healthy consumers and healthy workers. Um, so there's gotta, be a, there's gotta be a balance there somewhere. Any other questions? Yes, Tom, the next question asks, how long can the Fed afford to continue preserving the solvency of U.S. banks and propping up asset markets? The Fed can do it for a long time. There just doesn't seem to be any end in sight in what the Fed um, can do. And so this person may be very well aware that, um, so as, as mortgages, commercial-backed mortgage securities started to fail, um, banks were required by regulation to hold a certain amount of, of liquidity against their assets. The assets um, through these, these Basel Accords, assets that a bank holds and other financial intermediaries hold are ranked in terms of riskiness, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, what have you. And the riskiness of each asset requires a certain amount of capital to be held in reserves against that asset, okay? It's something called risk weighting. And so, so banks have to hold a certain amount of capital against the riskiness of an asset. As mortgages and commercial mortgage-backed securities are failing, 
uh, are defaulting, some of these assets are becoming more risky. So the banks are required to hold more capital against those. Well, so here's some of the problems is that, and I, and I actually heard, uh, we had a guest speaker in uh, one of my colleagues' classes this week who mentioned this as well, is that there were, there were periods in the last five weeks, especially in the, in the bond market, where people are trying to sell, um, let's say, corporate bonds, okay? And they're becoming riskier because as part of a, the corporate bond um, agreement, you're supposed to receive, for many, many corporate bonds, some kind of a coupon payment, semi-annual. They're going to pay you some money. For, so you say, I'm going to lend you some money through this bond, and then you're going to pay me periodically a, a coupon payment. And then at the end, you have to pay me this principal. And so people were fearful. If, if, a, if let's say, Ford doesn't have any revenue, is it likely that Ford's actually going to make my coupon payment? If they're not, then they default. Well, that default risk uh, pushes up the riskiness of the asset. So banks were trying to sell these bonds and there were days where there were zero buyers. So they're like, you know, in, in, in most situations prior to this, I mean, you sell a bond and somebody will make the market. Somebody will stop in and say, fine, I'll be a market maker. You know, I'll buy this thing up. But you had days where people were saying, okay, I'm going to sell these Ford bonds. And there was chirps. <laughs> Nobody was buying anything. And so the Fed said, great, we'll buy it, like whatever you have. And, and with, the, uh, with the possibility that some of these bonds could default, they might start being classified as junk bonds and junk categories if the yields go above 10%, right? And so you could have bonds that were rated, let's say investment grade, let's say triple B, and then all of a sudden get downgraded to triple B minus or something like this. And all of a sudden they become junk bond territory. And this isn't stuff that the Fed is supposed to be transacting in, but they're doing it. So the Fed is buying everything that everybody puts on their table. So the total number of swaps that the like overnight swaps the Fed is doing is insane right now. Um, so they're purchasing everything that they can. Um, they can do this for a long, 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 long time. Bal the balance sheet of the Fed is, is pretty robust. So they can convert cash into these assets. The real question, or one of the questions I think is really daunting is, how does the Fed unwind their balance sheet when it's all said and done? And again, there was a really great guest speaker on, on uh, Dr. Uh, Rosenzweig's class this week who mentioned the same thing. That is, once the Fed has all of these assets, so now it's holding, it's holding what are classified at the time as, let's say, triple B minus bonds, bonds that are in junk territory, could potentially be in junk territory, how does the Fed unwind that? Like they can't do it all at once to flood the market with these bonds and they'll just destroy that market. So they have to unwind it. They might be unwinding this thing for 10 years. It's kind of ridiculous uh, because they're buying everything possible in order to keep liquidity in the market. So the Fed has a robust balance sheet. The Fed can make these purchases. They can continue to make these purchases for, for a long time what they do with all the stuff on their balance sheets, that's something different. I don't think anybody knows how they're going to be able to unwind that stuff. Um, would a state bankruptcy necessarily be a bad thing? Illinois has run decade long fiscal deficits. Uh, yeah, it would, it would absolutely be a bad thing. And so it's, so what I saw some politicians saying was that, you know, just let the states go bankrupt. But the, I mean, the, the states can't, the states just don't have the ability to borrow at the same level of, um, as the Fed does. So let's take the counter position, right? All the states should go bankrupt. Great. When they're going bankrupt, then some of their obligations get wiped off the books. So railroad workers, that's a federal program, but state university retirement system workers, people who've worked for, you know, Department of Motor Vehicles, their pension plans. I mean, essentially all these pension plans for, for cops and firefighters, I mean, that all just goes away, okay? And when, when a state declares bankruptcy, it's, it isn't a, it's not a great solution. It's, it might be a good solution for the state, but if you ever had a, an employee relationship with the state, it is not in your best interest. And you might say, well, 
I, you know, I never worked at one of those jobs, so you know, I guess it's not going to impact me. Yeah, but it, it would certainly impact the economy going forward because all these people who put their time in and gave the state their money, so it's not, if you get a pension because you worked for, let's say, the DMV or something like this, it's not like you're just getting free money. Like the state took money out of your paycheck as you were working. And now they're giving you a retirement fund. I mean, your present value, future value, these things, you know, they have to equal. And so if you put the time in and they took money out of your paycheck, then by every right, you deserve that money back with interest. And that's what people are getting. So if a state declares bankruptcy, then some of that might be wiped off the books. You say, whatever, uh, who cares? Well, all those people would then be without jobs. They'd be without incomes. They've already retired. They've already done their 20 years, 30 years more, right? And so, and that would certainly impact the ability for those people to live and to engage in economic activity. If it was, uh, let's say the counterfactual, if it was such a great idea, then every state in the country should just go bankrupt. I don't think that would be good for the economy at all. As a matter of fact, it would, in a normal situation, that would be an economic shock right in and of itself to just throw everything out of whack. So I don't know. A bankruptcy, I don't think, is a great option. It's not good for the. It's not good for former employees for sure. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to some of the inflationary and deflationary pressures created by uh, the economic stimulus and Fed facilities across the short and long term? Yeah, so, the, so right now, I mean, a lot of people are thinking, well, all this liquidity, right? Isn't there some kind of inflationary tendency when the Fed decreases interest rates? Aren't we going to have inflation? No, we, we are, that's not necessarily true. Uh, I mean, inflation is, by and large, a monetary phenomenon. That is true. And if you want to see that in action, just watch an episode of Survivor where they have one of their Survivor auctions. Give everybody $500 and let them bid on pancakes and cheeseburgers. And the price of pancakes goes up to $500. The price of cheeseburgers goes up to $500. So if you hover over an economy and drop a bunch of money, then you're going to get inflation. Mostly. In this situation, it's a little bit different. So banks are not lending. And so because banks are not lending, you're not going to get the same kind of inflationary tendencies as you would if banks were lending. So banks are have put a cap on um, refinancing mortgages. So I've talked to Chase, I've talked to Fifth Third, I've talked to some other banks. No, no refinancing for the next 90 days. Most banks have now changed the requirements for getting a loan. So where it used to be maybe 680 or now it's uh, 720. Right, and so you can't even get a mortgage unless you're hitting a 720 FICO score. That means banks aren't loan lending. So right now, there's I think there's actually more danger of a deflationary pressure. So when we have what's called a demand side shock, which is what the, what we're experiencing, consumers aren't spending. When you have a demand side shock, you actually have deflationary pressures. The reason that deflation is so scary is that if I told you that you could buy a computer uh, next weekend, instead of, instead of like tomorrow or, 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 or Saturday, next weekend, it'll be 5% cheaper. Then you'll wait. Then, 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 then next weekend, if I said, wait, if you wait another week, it'll be 5% cheaper yet. Then you'll wait. And you wait another week and I'll say, it'll be 5% cheaper yet. What you'll do is you'll say, I'm just going to hold off on my consumption until prices settle. So deflationary trends, although they make your dollar more valuable, create um, a sense of, let's say, um, a, a sense of holding back in terms of your consumption. You wait to get the best deal possible. As a result, consumption actually starts to fall. That's the worst thing we can have in our current economic environment is pressures that are pulling away consumption. What we want to do is we want to encourage people to consume, okay? So the, the fiscal stimulus packages so far should have created some inflationary tendencies. You just drop $1,000 into people's pockets and they go out and spend on goods and then that will push prices up, okay? Except for people don't have anything to spend their money on. It's the ordering online, right? And so I'm guessing online orders for just about every company have gone through the roof, but it's just it doesn't have the same kind of, let's say, uh, impact from a local level. So we're not seeing these inflationary tendencies. 
And so I think there's actually a deflationary trend. I don't like deflationary trends because it stops people in their tracks when it comes to buying uh, big ticket items. And that's not what we need in the current economy. Tom, if we could talk about the insurance industry for a moment, what do you believe is the likelihood of governments, both domestic and global, mandating insurance pol policy coverage of pandemic events? Um, wow, Mand and like mandating, mandating coverage. So, I, I mean, I, so I don't know how this is gonna play out. Here's some of the things that I've seen sort of peripherally and just this barely skim on this question. And that is, there's going to be some lawsuits that are going to come up. And it's going to be incredibly difficult for people to, let's say, sue their, excuse me, sue their employer if they catch COVID because it's going to be difficult to prove where it is that they actually caught COVID. And so I have seen some legislation being pushed around or ideas of legislation being pushed around that say, are we going to, let's say, try to put a lid on those kind of lawsuits? How are those going to um, come about? Other people are putting lawsuits out there with respect to, uh, can you, I, do you really have the power to keep me off of, um, off of the streets or keep me from working, right? And so people feel that their personal liberties are, are being put at risk. A and uh, it's in all likelihood, some personal liberties are, right? It's just, uh, do, you, do you forgive those to, let's say, save people or save the economy? It's a very, very tough balance. I don't know if you are, if you force insurance companies to insure against COVID losses. So, I mean, you can buy insurance for just about everything and you can actually cover yourself for everything, right? I mean, Tom Brady probably has his arm insured. Okay, so you can find somebody who will insure everything. Mandating that companies engage in insurance, that's a different animal. And I would, I, that's gonna play out in, let's say, a back room with a bunch of lobbyists. I, I don't see it as a real viable, it's not a solution to anything that I can, can, I, I can see. Maybe I'm not understanding the question 100%, but I don't see how mandating insurance on losses or mandating people for coverage and being able to insure them against possible COVID infection fixes anything. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'd, be cur I'd be curious to have a conversation with the person who asked that, asked that question. They might know something that I don't know, or they might have an, an understanding about where this is gonna go. Uh, that's a very, very good question. I'm very curious about that. All right, great questions, everyone. Uh, we are gonna begin to wrap up part four of our webinar series on behalf of Emory Executive Education and Tom Smith. We thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. Of course, Tom will be back next Thursday, uh, April 30th for part five of the Economy and Me of our Bre Business Over Breakfast series. Um, as Nicola mentioned, we are also offering our personal financial workshop also led by our wonderful Tom Smith. Um, if you'd like to join us momentarily, we will have the registration link available on your screen if you're interested in registering for that particular workshop. In addition to that, a copy of this recording of part four of the webinar will be available um, later on today on the Emory Executive Education LinkedIn page. And last but certainly not least, um, before you all leave today, you will notice a brief survey pop up on your screens. We just ask that you all take one to two minutes to fill out that survey so that we can get your feedback on today's webinar. Tom, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to close us out. No, it's, I appreciate all the questions. I appreciate people reaching out. I have had people who've reached out sort of in the interim, make some recommendations, make some suggestions. I like that. And it's, um, I, you know, I don't have an agenda for this other than to answer questions. I am probably reading uh, every article that I can about just about every element of this to stay informed and to try to make sense of these things, having conversations with, um, with you know, as many different people as I can in many different industries. If you wanna reach out, you've got my email, tom.smith at emory.edu. Uh, you know, I look forward to interacting with people. I, I like hearing different perspectives. Um, and so I encourage you guys to continue doing that if you've got questions.